Let's take our Bibles together this morning and let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter number three, please. Third chapter in John's Gospel. I don't know about you, but I almost wanted to join in with them while they were singing that. That is a great song and such a great truth. Of course, we're just two weeks away uh, from the celebration of the resurrection, Easter Sunday. And uh, we certainly think about that, th- that theme uh, here in the weeks leading up to it. And uh, certainly looking forward to uh, that celebration. Hope that you'll make plans to be a part of that. On that Sunday, uh, we are going to have a special gift to give away to all of our guest visitors that are adults. So if you bring someone, we have a booklet that we'd like to put into their hands that we think will be a blessing to them. They'll hear the gospel in the the service and the message, but then they'll have it to take with them as well. And so I hope that you'll plan on bringing some guests, inviting some guests. And for all the children who come, uh, we're not going to be quite as spiritual with you. You're going to get some candy on your way out the door. And so uh, we, uh, we, we're certainly looking forward to Easter Sunday and hope that you're making some plans to invite uh, family and friends to worship the Lord. That's a, a Sunday uh, in which people are looking to go to church. A lot of Sundays that's not the case, but Easter is one of those types of days. And so let me encourage you to, uh, to be looking for who you can invite to be your guest that day. Would you stand with me if you found your place there in John chapter number three as we read the scripture? And uh, while we're doing that, we'll also dismiss the children, sixth grade and younger, to the fellowship hall for their own service. All of uh, the children, you can be dismissed at this time uh, that you would like to go and be a part of that service. You're more than welcome to. And uh, we're going to uh, get started here reading our text. John chapter number three is where we'll be. Uh, This morning, we'll begin reading in verse number one and read down through verse number three. The Bible says in verse number one, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Several weeks ago, we began a new message series entitled The Life of Christ. We looked at his baptism, and we've talked about his miracles, and today we're going to discuss his message. I'll be honest with you, it was a bit of a struggle to figure out where do you go, because certainly we find the words of Christ scattered throughout the Gospels. Certainly he preached the Sermon on the Mount, that would have been one of his messages, But as you study the ministry of Christ, a lot of the things that he said uh, were not necessarily new. Uh, They were things that had been taught by other religious leaders and certainly in the law and in the Old Testament. But when we come to John chapter number three, Jesus introduces a concept here that I suppose had never been heard before. We certainly see that by Nicodemus' reaction, the idea of being born again. This is a unique element of his message that uh, I suppose was the first time that it had ever been taught or ever been considered this idea of being born again. And so today we're going to discuss the life of Christ, his message, and here it is, ye must, ye must be born again. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word and how it speaks to our hearts. Thank you for these dear folks that are gathered with us. Thank you for those that were part of the service earlier at 9 a.m. Certainly grateful for them as well and for the decisions that were made in that service. And we're praying, Lord, that you'd do uh, an eternal work in hearts and lives here today. Uh, Lord, you've drawn people to this place in lots of different ways. Some, uh, Lord, have come for many years. Others, perhaps, are coming for the very first time. Uh, Some received an invitation on on their doorstep. Others, perhaps, were invited by a friend. Maybe some others found us by way of the internet. But Lord, we're here today, and Lord, these people have not come to hear from me, but they've come to hear a message from you, and so we pray, Lord, that they'd hear you loud and clear today. Lord, bless us during this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, we are inundated with messages on a regular basis. I I think to myself that in today's world, you'll get messages in lots of different forms, right? You'll get messages in your your physical mailbox. You'll come home from work, and and perhaps if you're like me, one of the first things I want to do is, have we we got any mail today? I want to go look in the mailbox, and and certainly in the mailbox, there will be bills that need to be paid, and uh, and there'll be junk mail that's there advertising certain things. And every once in a while, uh, you'll get a handwritten message from somebody, and that's 
that's all was encouraged. Maybe a note or a card. And we get, we get mail in our physical mailbox. And we have mailboxes, some of us at home, but also at work. And uh, you've got a box that you check, or maybe you're a student and they're in your college, whatever the case might be, you've got a mailbox with uh, ways that they can funnel messages to you. Uh, we get messages by way of a voice mailbox today. Uh, I have a voicemail box in my office that folks can call and leave messages. I have a voicemail on my cell phone that folks can leave a message for me and I can call them back. And, and uh, some of you, some of you even still have a landline in your home and you've got a, something called an answering machine and you'll push the button and it'll relay the messages. I love some of the folks in our church. They won't, they won't answer the phone until they identify themselves on the answering machine. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'll be in the middle of leaving my message. Hey, brother so-and-so, this is Pastor Pete. And all of a sudden, hello? Now, you were lying to me. You didn't want me to think anybody was home, but you were home after all. You're just, that's old school um, uh, call, caller ID, I guess you might want to say. But we get messages that way. Uh, we get messages uh, by way of texts. I can, first, I can remember when that first started and, and trying to figure that whole thing out. How do you text people? And now, of course, uh, hardly any of us can live without the ability to text. And that's perhaps maybe one of our primary uh, modes of communication. Uh, then there's email. And uh, we get emails. That's another way that you get messages. And then there are direct messages through the various social media sites and, and that sort of thing. And if you're anything like me, certain messages uh, receive a higher priority than others. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, you'll come home and you'll check the, the mailbox and, and if, you'll do, if you're like me, I separate the mail between junk and bills and then what looks like it's a handwritten note. That, 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 and by the way, that's what I open first. The bills can wait, right? They can, they can wait a long time. But someone took the time to write my name down and, and, to, and to drop it in the mail, put a stamp on it and write a note to me and to my family. I want to read that. I want to know what it has to say. Uh, when, my, when my family texts me or uh, when I get a voicemail from someone and it seems like it's an urgent thing, it perhaps maybe gets a higher level of priority than something else. And I want to ask this question this morning. Where, where does the message of Jesus rank in priority for you. Where does the message of Christ, where does it rank in priority for you? You say, well, how would you know where, where it ranks? Well, let me just tell you that the message of Jesus, the message of Christ is found in this book. It's found in the Bible. This is God's word. Therefore, listen, your faithfulness to read this book and then also to obey this book would, to me, be a pretty good indicator of just how high of a priority you place upon this message. You see, when, when, when a message is not a priority, you might take it or leave it. It might, might even be a physical piece of mail that just gets dropped in the trash can. You never even read it. But when it's something that's of high priority, I want to know what this person had to say. I want to know what's being offered here. Then what do you do? You rip it open as fast as you can. You pull the contents out. You read and examine them. The message of Christ is found in this book, the Bible. It's found in God's word. And if, if it's a priority for you, then that would be, an indic be indicated by your, your uh, commitment to reading it, but not just reading it, but also obeying it. Be, don't, don't just be a, a hearer of the word, but be also a doer of the word as well. You know, as we've considered the life of Christ, we've looked at some things that he did. We talked in the very first message in this series on his baptism, and that was something that he did. We talked about his miracles, and we talked about him turning water into wine last Sunday. That was something that he did. But today, today we are going to consider what he said. You know, there really are two primary ways that we communicate messages. There is the idea of communication verbally. In other words, it's what we say. We communicate verbally. We open our mouths and we tell people what's on our minds and, and that's a form of communication. But you know as well as I do that verbal communication is not all of the communication that's in our world. In fact, those that have studied this will tell you, they've studied interpersonal relationships and communication between people, and they will tell you that actually verbal communication is a very small portion of the way that we communicate. There is also not just verbal communication, but we communicate non-verbally as well. So in other words, there's the things that I say, and then there's also the things that I do or the way that I live. In communication, I can, I can say something, 
The words could come out of my mouth, but the way that they're communicated could indicate to you he doesn't mean what he's saying. Right? I, but, I, I could say, but, I, but I said it. For instance, you might, you might be in a uh, you know, relationship with your wife and you might, you might come home and, and she, might, she might look at you and she'd say, honey, sweetheart, you, you haven't told me you've, you, you love me recently. And you could look at her and you'd say, well, I do. And that's gonna make her feel so wonderful. <laughs> that's gonna make her feel just warm and fuzzy inside. Now, did you, did you communicate, well, I love you? But there's the way that it's said. How often you, I often think of this illustration when you're, mo you're monitoring or you're coming in to mediate a fight between two children. You tell him you're sorry, and he says it. But you can tell the way he says it, he doesn't mean it. Not in the least bit. So you understand, listen, communication messages are so much more than just what is said, but there's also the way that it is said uh, and, and, and the things that are done. Truthfully, again, nonverbal communication can be much louder and more effective than verbal communication. I want to share with you that Jesus Christ spoke verbally of his resurrection. He spoke about that throughout his earthly ministry, but it wasn't until he actually rose from the dead that his disciples understood what he was saying. We find, it, we find an allusion to that in John chapter number two. I want you to see it real quickly. Would you look with me in verse number 19? You're already in chapter three. Just look back one chapter. And in verse number 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Now look in verse number 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. So here's the point. For, for three years, Jesus had said, listen, you destroy this body, you kill me, and I will rise again from the grave. And his disciples heard it. They heard the words that he said, but it didn't connect. But when he did it, when he actually rose from the dead, it took them back, and they remember, wait a minute, wait a minute. He had told us this was going to happen. He had warned us that this was coming. Now it all makes sense. Can I, can I just pause here for a moment and, and remind you that there is nothing, there is nothing that Christ said or claimed that is ever distorted or marred by what he did. Nor is there anything that he did that is distorted by what he said. In other words, in other words, Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry is a perfect balance. See, I'm not like that. You spend enough time with me and you'll discover that sometimes the things that I say, even up here, sometimes I get, I, I'm, I'm just like anybody else and I don't always, I don't always do the things that I say. I'm a man. Sometimes I'll stand here and I'll preach about how a, a husband's to love his wife. And if you followed around, me around long enough, you'd probably find there's some times that I don't love my wife the way that I should. You, you'll, you'll hear me sometimes and I'll talk about a parents being good parents and fathers not provoking their children to wrath. You follow me around long enough and you'll find that Pastor Pete sometimes provokes his children to wrath. But listen, everything that Jesus claimed, everything that he said, he did. There's, there, there's, there's, no, there, there's no distortion there. Jesus is a perfect balance between that which he said and that which he did. And in John chapter number three, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who is a ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus. And this man had carefully observed Jesus according to verse number two, and he was intrigued by him. He was curious about this man by the name of Jesus and his ministry. Here was his assessment so far. As he had watched him closely, as he has examined him, he says this. He said, he said we think, we think you're, you're, you're somebody sent from God because the things that you do, the miracles that you do, can only come from someone who is closely associated with God. Now at this point, at this point, is he a believer in the Messiah? No. But he's certainly, God is certainly drawing him. He's curious, he's intrigued, he's wondering, hey, there's something different about this man. And by the way, that's, that's the way it starts with all of us. We, we come to a relationship with Jesus first by watching him closely, by reading the words that he says. Sometimes we come into a relationship by watching other believers. 
And if they live their lives in such a way, in other words, if their message matches up with their life, it may cause us to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something different about this man. The way that he makes a difference in the lives of people. Nicodemus had not yet acknowledged Jesus as Messiah. Uh, the Bible tells us that he came, he came to Jesus by night. This is certainly a, a reference to sort of a longing for privacy. And a, and a fear of the Pharisees and the other Jews. And so Nicodemus really, when we come to him in John chapter number three, and he comes to Jesus, he is a conflicted man. He's really confused. He's trying to find his way. And the third chapter of John contains the private conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. But more importantly, I want you to know that it not only contains a message from Jesus to Nicodemus, but I believe John chapter number three contains a message from Jesus to all men. And the message is this, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's the message of Christ. The message of Christ is different than any other message that you'll ever hear. And here it is, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now I want you to notice some things with me about this message. Number one, I want you to notice that it is a trustworthy message. The message of Christ is a trustworthy message. As you, as you read this, you find in verse number three and in verse number five, you'll find this phrase repeated twice. And the phrase is this, verily, verily. Now we don't, we don't use that a whole lot. You know, if somebody were to call me and they were to say, is this, is this Pete Folger on the phone? I don't say, verily, verily it is. And neither do you. We don't use that terminology anymore. But I want you to understand, there's a reason why Jesus uses it. Here's what the word verily means. It means trustworthy. It means surely. It means amen. In other words, here's what he's saying. He's saying, Nicodemus, listen, listen. What I'm getting ready to tell you is trustworthy. It's trustworthy. Now, in order for us to understand just how trustworthy it is, we have to ask ourselves the question, who is Jesus? Because a message that is delivered is only, listen, it's only so good as the originator of the message. So in other words, in other words, if Jesus, listen, if Jesus is just like any other man, then his message is as trustworthy as any other man's message, which is not very trustworthy. You see, messages, messages are, can be subjective, right? They can be based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinions. For instance, I could, I could stand before you today and, and I, could, I could say, you know, that this, this political party is the best political party. And all of that is based on my own subjectivity. It's based on my personal feelings, my own personal opinions on things. And you could sit out there and you could think to yourself, well, that, that, does not, that does not resonate with me. That's not the way that I was raised. That's not what I think. And we could sit here and we could disagree. And, 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 and your message could be just the same as mine. You could sit there and say, well, I believe this. I could stand in front of you and I could say, uh, you know, the best restaurant in the world is this restaurant. And you could sit there and say, I've been there before. Wasn't that great? Subjective. I happened to go there on a really good night. I got a great waiter. The chef that night was really good. The night you went, you didn't get a good waiter. They microwaved your food, you know, or whatever the case might be. And it's subjective. It's not very trustworthy. But Jesus says here in John chapter number three, verily, verily, he's saying, surely, surely, this message is trustworthy. But listen, if Jesus is a normal man like the rest of us, and this message is not very trustworthy. Because I am a fallen man and I have a sin nature, there might always be, when I tell you something, there might always be some element of doubt in your mind regarding the things that I'm telling you. That's why, by the way, it's so important. Every service we tell you, open your Bibles. And we share a message for you from, with you from God's word. See, there's not a person in this room that came here today to hear my opinions. Because my opinions are subjective. They don't really matter. They're, they're the same as your opinions. Here's what, here's what matters. What, what does God's word have to say? What does this book have to say? So why should you believe the message of Jesus? Why should you hear his message and understand that it is trustworthy? Well, you have to ask the question, who is he? Who is he? You see, some view Christ uh, like he's just an ordinary average man like you and me. Therefore, the things that he says are subjective. Well, that's his opinion. Well, that's what he thinks. But, but, but listen to me, if he is who he claims to be, we can no longer say that. 
We can no longer say, well, that's just his opinion. No, if he is who he claims to be, then we have to understand, hold on a minute, this is God speaking. Consider the life of Christ, several events in his life that are recorded for us in the Bible indisputably reveal him to be more than just a man like you and me. Several events in his life reveal him to be God. I remind you of his birth. In Luke chapter number two, the Bible gives us some insight into the day in which Jesus Christ was born. Did you know that Jesus was born of a virgin? Did you know that Jesus in his birth, where he was born and when he was born and how he was born, all of these things, listen, all of these things are a fulfillment of prophecy that was given in the Old Testament. And did you know, did you know that on the night that he was born, the angels, listen, the angels serenaded shepherds announcing his arrival. Now let me ask you this question. How many people do you know that were born of a virgin? None, except for him. How many people do you know that in their birth and in their life, they fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament? I only know one, his name is Jesus. How many people do you know that on the night that they were born, the angels serenaded in the sky announcing arrival? Now listen, I know when I was born, my grandmother probably serenaded. And yours probably did as well, and your mother, because they're so thrilled a baby had been born. But on the night that Jesus was born, the heavens opened, and the angels proclaimed glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace could be a little to men. In, in, this, in this city is born a Savior whose name is Christ the Lord. Only one person can claim those things. His name is Jesus. But not just his birth reveal him to be this Messiah, but his baptism In Matthew chapter number three, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but Jesus was baptized. He was baptized in deep water in the Jordan River. He was baptized by immersion. He was baptized at the hands of John the Baptist. The Bible tells us when he came up out of that water, the Holy Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And all of a sudden, those that were there heard a strange noise coming coming from heaven. The voice said this, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I believe we have someone to baptize today, and I'm thankful for their baptism, but listen, when they get baptized, you're not gonna hear a voice from heaven, and no dove is gonna fly into this auditorium and descend on that person, why? Because that person is a man just like you and just like me. But when Jesus was baptized, the voice of God was heard. How many of you know like that, only one? How about his miracles? The Bible tells us in John 2, the stated purpose for the miracles that Christ performed was to declare him as Messiah. The one who was sent from God. So let me ask this question. How many do you know who can turn water into wine? How many do you know who can heal the blind, the deaf, and the dumb? How many do you know that can raise the dead back to life? Who can walk on water? Who can calm raging seas? How many people do you know who can feed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two small fish? I only know one. His name is Jesus. Not only that, but his death and burial and resurrection reveal him to be the Messiah. He was betrayed and arrested. He was beaten and tortured. He was crucified, buried. And the Romans were careful, listen, they were careful to set guards around his grave for fear, for fear that his followers might try to steal his body and claim that he had risen from the dead. And yet, and yet the soldiers and the stone and even death itself were no match for him as Jesus, our Savior, rose triumphantly and victoriously on the third day. What man do you know who can do this? So as we consider the life of Christ, we look at what he did, and what he did reveals him to be Messiah. And then we consider, well, what does he have to say? And if what he says matches up with what he does, well, then we've got a pretty trustworthy message here. And here is the message of Jesus. Ye must be born again. It's a trustworthy message. He said it, therefore you and I must believe it. We discover that his person, listen, his person verifies that his message is trustworthy. In other words, because all of these things reveal him to be God, reveal him to be Messiah, therefore, therefore, every word that comes out of his mouth is trustworthy. So when he says you must be born again, guess what? That means you must be born again. He says if you're gonna see the kingdom of God, you've gotta be born again. Well, guess what? If you're gonna see the kingdom of God, if you're gonna go to heaven someday, you've gotta do it his way. You see, God is incapable of lying. Titus chapter number one and verse number two, the Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You know the difference between you and me, or you and him, is this. The Bible says he cannot lie. For us, we, we cannot help but lie. It's part of our fallen nature. 
It's part of the fact that we're sinners. The Bible tells us in the book of, uh, of Hebrews chapter six and verse number 18 uh, that it was impossible for God to lie. John in chapter 17 and verse number 17, Jesus said this, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word, speaking of God's word, is truth. Ultimately, he told his disciples in John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now listen, you have a choice to make. Today, you can choose whether to believe him or not believe him, but if Jesus is who he claims to be and the Bible definitely reveals that he is who he says he is, then his message is true. Paul wrote these words in Romans chapter three and verse number four, let God be true, but every man a liar. And so the message of Jesus is trustworthy. When he says you must be born again, then you really must be born again. But notice, notice not only is it a trustworthy message, but notice it is an exclusive message. Would you look in verse number three again? Notice he says, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look with me, if you would, in verse number seven. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Can I tell you that Jesus in this message, he, he reveals here just how helpless man is in the condition of his first birth. Now this had to be a hard thing for Nicodemus to hear and to grasp. You see, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and Pharisees, they specialized in works. They specialized in rituals and religious exercise. And here Jesus is telling him, he says, I say unto you, I say unto thee, all of these things that you've done will not help you. Now imagine that. Here's, here's a man, here's a man who had, who had done all the right things that the law said he had to do. He dressed right, he looked right, he talked right, he worshiped on the right days. He, he probably had all the scriptures memorized. He had done all of these things, and yet Jesus looks at him and says, all of those things that you've done, you've invested your life, you've given yourself to these things, they don't matter at all. Now imagine that for just a moment. Well, that come as a shock. Here's a guy who thinks by being good and by offering sacrifices and, and, and by wearing the right thing and, 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 uh, and going to the synagogue on the right days and by carrying himself in a certain way and by saying the right words and giving a certain amount of money, he, in his mind he's thinking all of these things are helping me and Jesus comes along and he says, here, I'm getting ready to blow you out of the water. Those things don't help you at all. Those things do nothing for you whatsoever except a man be born again. He even goes so far as to say, marvel not that I said unto thee. He could tell Nicodemus was shocked by hearing this message. And you know, there's a lot of people in our world today that are shocked by that kind of message. Because they've been taught all of their lives, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And you've got to go to church and you've got to be baptized and you've got to take communion and you've got to tithe and give a certain amount of money and you've got to dress a certain way and you've got to talk a certain way. And Jesus comes along and says, you don't have to do any of those things. That doesn't matter. You need to be born again. Oh, you gotta, you gotta imagine that that comes as quite a shock to this man by the name of Nicodemus. So man, listen, we are helpless. We are helpless in our condition of our first birth, our physical birth. But notice there's a second part to this message. That is this, I'm, I'm helpless there, but there is a way for me to be helped. And that is that I must be born again. There is only one way to heaven. Only one way to heaven. This week, my oldest daughter and I traveled. I traveled to Pensacola, Florida. There's a large Christian college down there. Many of our young people have been there, and, and several of them are there right now. And, and I was invited to preach there this week, and so, uh, so we went. She and I went together. She's a junior in high school, praying about her future. And so prior to making that trip, I went online, and, uh, and I, looked for, um, I looked for tickets to fly into Pensacola, Florida. And there were several airlines, several different options and carriers that offered to take me to that location. And any one of them, listen, any one of them would have gotten me there. And by the way, I could have, I could have gotten there by, by driving my own car, and I could have gotten there by hopping on a train, I suppose. There'd probably be a train that would take me there at some point. And uh, I, I, could have, I could have got there by hitchhiking or by walking or riding my bike. I could have gotten to Pensacola, Florida a lot of different ways. I chose the most convenient way, the fastest way. So I looked online, I'm gonna fly. And I looked at two things, number one, number one, what time does it get me there? And number two, how much does it cost? 
Those were the two things that I was most concerned about. And, um, and, 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 I, and I, find a, I found something that worked the best for me and for her, and we made our trip. Can I say that the same thing can be said of just about any destination in this world? Many times, even when someone travels somewhere, they'll make a recommendation to you. Hey, I, I've been there before. Make sure, if you're gonna go there, make sure you stay here. Make sure, I really like this one, make sure you eat here. <laughs> I'm always interested in that. And then they'll say something like this. You know, there's, there's a lot of things to do there, and, um, and, I, and I've done this. It's not that great. Don't waste your money on that, but make sure you do this. And make sure, if you're flying, take this flight and rent from this rental car agency and do this and do that. And they make all of these recommendations based on the fact that they've been there already. Can I tell you that many believe getting to heaven is like getting to Pensacola, Florida, or any other location in the world. They believe that all ways are acceptable and man simply, listen, man simply chooses the one he likes best based on convenience. The problem is, it's a big problem. When you die, you're not going to Pensacola, Florida or Orlando or any other location. While some can make recommendations based on personal experience as to when to travel and where to travel, they've been to those places and how to get there, no one, no one alive today no one that you know, that I know, has ever died and returned to talk about it. Except for one. His name is Jesus. Jesus has something to say about it. You see, you could talk to a lot of people about traveling to a lot of different places, and they could give recommendations, but no one's ever died and gone to heaven or gone to hell and come back to talk about it. It doesn't work that way. So you and I, we must make the decision in one of three ways, you can make the decision to follow your own heart. By the way, it's always a disaster. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If you want to trust and follow your own heart uh, to get you to heaven someday, to get you eternal life, well, be my guest, but that's not wise. I'm here to warn you against that because the heart will always lead you astray. You can, you can follow some other man who knows, who knows as much as you do about it because he's never done it either. And there are men that'll stand in front of you. There are religious gurus and religious uh, leaders and founders of cults and different things, and they'll tell you, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. The problem is, listen, the problem is they're no different than you and than me. Their opinion is subjective like we talked about earlier, or, or you can believe Jesus and the word of God. According to Jesus, there is only one way to heaven, and that is by being born again. Nicodemus, of course, is troubled by this. He, he, he asks the question, he says, how can I enter into my mother's womb and be born a second time? And then Christ reveals to him, I'm not talking about a physical rebirth, but I'm talking about a spiritual rebirth. Every man, listen, every man you and I have ever met Every, look around the room today. Every person in here has been born once. Can I tell you something? Not every person in here has born, been born twice. Not every person in the restaurant that you'll go to this afternoon has been born twice. All of them have a first birth, but so few people have a second birth. Several years ago, I was dealing with a man who was of the Catholic faith, and I was sharing the gospel with him, and we had developed a relationship with one another, and we got to John chapter number three, and I said, I said, sir, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And I looked at him, I said, have you ever been born again? And you know what he said to me? Here's a guy who was a really good guy. Every week he was in church, faithful, altar boy as a boy growing up, beautiful family, wife and children, business owner, and he looked at me, and he said, I've never heard of such a thing. Here's a guy who lives 15, 20 minutes away from here, within, certainly within the reach of this church. And here was a man who had never heard that Jesus said, you must be born again. See, most churches don't teach that. They don't preach that. Many have never heard of a second birth. And Jesus said that it is essential. It is a must. You cannot go to heaven without the new birth. And you might ask the question, what's so bad about my first birth? Why do I have to be born again? According to the Bible, we are born sinners. Romans chapter number three, verses nine to 11, the Bible says, what then? Are we better than they? Speaking of Jews as opposed to Gentiles? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Not a single person is righteous. That same chapter would go on to declare in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus, the, the word of God would say, Jesus speaking through the apostle Paul, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. 
So here's the point. If you've only been born one time, you're still in your sin. And according to God's word, the penalty for that sin is death. Revelation 21.8 reveals that there are actually two deaths just as there are two births. The first death is the death we often think about. It's, it's visiting a funeral home, understanding that life has left the body physically. But the second death, according to the Bible, is separation from God forever and ever in a place called not just hell, but the Bible tells us in Revelation 21 and verse number eight that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So here's Jesus' message. If you've only been born once, you have to die twice. But if you'll be born again, you only have to die once. You only have to die a physical death, but you never have to worry about dying an eternal, a spiritual death, separated from God for all of eternity in a place the Bible calls the lake of fire. To be born again, you must believe in Jesus and accept that his death on the cross was the payment that satisfied a holy God's wrath for your sin. It is very possible that you're here today and you've always thought that your good works, your faithful church attendance, your baptism, some religious exercise, or your kindness or generosity, you thought maybe like Nicodemus, those things would secure a home in heaven for you. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but can I tell you that these things, listen, these things, if they're done all your life, they won't buy you 15 minutes in heaven, much less eternity there. If Nicodemus, a member of the Pharisees, a rule keeper, a law follower, if he needed to be born again to go to heaven, then every man, every woman, every child must be born again. Only the new birth secures entrance into that place. Therefore, listen, Christ's message was exclusive. There is only one way to go to heaven, and Jesus is that way. Thirdly and finally, not only is this message trustworthy and it's exclusive, but it's inclusive. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how is a message that's in exclusive be inclusive as well? Well, there is only one way to heaven, but here's the point. If you go that one way, everyone can go there. Would you look with me in verse 15 of the same chapter? Jesus is speaking. He says that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I will tell you that I am not a, I am not a, uh, a linguist. Uh, I, I, I sometimes I have to look some of these words up just as, just as well as you do. What exactly does that mean? But you know, I, I must tell you that in my study, I didn't have to pour over the word whosoever. You know what whosoever means? It means anybody. I don't know, I don't know who who you are maybe and what you've done, but whosoever means, means you. Perhaps you're here today and you're guilty of some awful things. Jesus said, if you just believe in him, he'll save you. Maybe you're here today and, and in, all, in, our, in our world in recent days, we've heard a lot about race and racism, haven't we? Can I tell you, the gospel is utterly uninterested in what color of skin you are. Jesus died for everybody. Oh, I, I know what it is. Maybe, maybe you're here today, and, and uh, over the last year, it's been pretty toxic politically. But guess what? Democrats have to be saved the same way Republicans have to be saved, the same way libertarians and communists and socialists have to be saved. We all come the same way. We believe in Jesus. That's it. You might be Catholic or Muslim or Methodist, or agnostic, or atheist, or, or Baptist. Doesn't matter, we all get saved the same way. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If you'll repent of your sin today, if you'll believe that Jesus died for you, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, you can be saved today. That is the message of Christ. The message of Christ is true and trust trustworthy because, because of who he is. He's God. The message is exclusive. There's only one way to get to heaven, only one door that you must walk through, and that is by being born again, but it is also inclusive. Everyone, everyone can go there, provided, provided they go through the one door, which is Jesus Christ.